you have suffered mm -hmm. financial loss while investing and you think your bank, broker, fund management company, unit trust management company, ERS provider or distributor, or their agent or representative is responsible. You need help sorting out the problem or want to seek redress. Where do you go? Sidrek is here to help you start the conversation and reach some resolution. First, lodge a formal complaint with a company that sold or offered you the unit trusts, shares, derivatives, or other capital market product or service. But you're not happy with their response. You have 180 days from their final written reply to come to Sidrek. Or if there's no written response, and it's been 90 days since you wrote to them, you don't need to wait longer. You may come to Sidrek even though you haven't received a final response yet. Sidrek first checks the eligibility of your claim. For example, is it within Sidrek's claim limit? Is it against a member of Sidrek? And so forth. If your case is eligible, we begin the dispute resolution process. All information in this process is confidential. We get both you and the member you're complaining against to sit with us and have a conversation. Documents and information will be required from both parties. No lawyers are allowed in the mediation process as we keep the discussions informal and private. Our mediators are impartial and will hear both sides out and help parties communicate constructively towards resolving the dispute. Two outcomes are possible at this stage. Either both you and the member agree to a settlement, or you don't. If the both of you agree to a settlement, an agreement is signed and the mediation process ends successfully. But if both you and the member fail to reach a satisfactory resolution, mediation has thus failed. But don't worry, Citrek then proceeds to the next stage, adjudication. During adjudication, parties are given the chance to provide any further information to help their case and ask each other further questions. Our adjudicator will then study and consider all facts and information provided, including the conduct of the parties, laws and best industry practices, as well as what's fair and reasonable. Sidrek's adjudicator will then make a final decision on the dispute and the monetary claim. If the decision is in your favour, it could be a full award or a partial award for your claim. But if the decision isn't in your favour, then no award will be made. You, the investor, will still have a choice. If you reject the decision, Sidrek will simply close the case and you may seek other legal avenues for redress. If you choose to accept the decision, however, the member has to comply with it. Once the parties have confirmed compliance to the decision, Sidrek will close the case. So let Sidrek help start the conversation towards resolution. For more information, visit sidrek.com.my or call 03-2282-2280. Hello everybody, welcome to this webinar brought to you by Bursa Malaysia and as managed by our company LifeChamp. Today our webinar title is Will 2024 be a positive year for the economy? My name is Shen Chu and the moderator for this session. Now in this webinar, we are going to examine how each underlying factor is going to change the economy and what is the cause of cause and effect of which factor to change the economy. Okay, today we're going to learn uh, a big deal about the economy and then we are going to arrive at a conclusion, right? Will 2024 be a positive year for the economy? All right, so before we begin, as usual, disclaimer, whatever we share in this session is only for educational purpose. In no way that I give any recommendation for you to buy or sell any listed securities that we mentioned here. If you decide to make any investment decisions, you're 100% responsible for all your investment risk. Now, allow me to briefly introduce our speaker today. Uh, she is an experienced policy analyst who has worked in international and national projects related to fiscal policies and economic development. She has served the United Nations Development Program Country Office and was part of the UNDP Asia Pacific Regional Economies Network. Prior to that, she has been an associate professor in economics in International Islamic University, Malaysia, teaching and supervising research outputs for more than two decades. 
She started her career in Bank Negara, Malaysia in 1992, where she gained valuable lessons in policy design and the impact on the economy. And she earned her master's in economic degree from University of Kebangsaan, Malaysia, and a doctorate degree in economics from University of Nottingham, United Kingdom. And she's none other than Dr. Haniza Khalid. Doctor, how are you today? Good, good. Thank you, Shane. Yeah, we are very honored to have you here uh, on this webinar to share with us about the economic outlook as well as how do we master the economy and understand the impact to the economy of each pol policy. With that, I will just hand over the session to you. I've just stopped sharing my screen. You may proceed with your screen sharing. Can you see my screen? Not yet, huh? Not yet, not yet. Mm -hmm. Yes, now we can see it. You can go to okay. full screen, then we're all ready to go. All right. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Assalamualaikum. Thank you so much for joining me uh, today, where I will try to unpack uh, what makes the economy, um, what are the macroeconomic variables that will affect the stock market. Well, actually, the stock market and the real economy, are they, they behave differently, but at a certain um, in certain areas, they do affect each other. Uh, but usually, we know that the effect will not happen at the same time yeah, because the stock market is very much an emotional uh, creature yeah, because it, it, a, lot of, a lot of things that goes into the mind of the investor, the psychology of timing of which direction to go, what will be affected, which country you have to follow. There's a lot of things that goes in the mind uh, when you invest compared to the real economics. It's all about, you know, real sales, goods and services, what's the number, What's the, how many people are not working, how many people are working. So it's very much hard data, but the share market is, is, uh, is much more um, um, psychology, what you understand. So that's why the topic today is very interesting. What we, what uh, Whether uh, 2024 will be a positive, a negative year or a neutral year for the stock market. Yeah, That means if we are required uh, to try to um, develop an outlook of the market yeah, or outlook of the economy, the prospects of the economy, try to forecast the economy and therefore the effect on the stock market. So all this forecasting, predicting is a very difficult thing to do because even as humans, we don't know what we're going to eat tomorrow, right? So how are we going to predict what's going to happen uh, in 2024? So it all means uh, you can make predictions. Uh, the easiest way to make predictions is just make a bet. Lah, eh? Or you use a crystal ball like, or something. You just, you know, you just put a bet and take a risk. And then that's where positioning, that's the position that you're going to take. Another kind of prediction is you follow what's the vibe in the market. Yeah, the market is going to go this side, market is going this side, but you don't understand why. Another, the third way to predict is usually by understanding what are the main uh, fundamentals. Yeah? So we say fundamentals. What are the things that will move the market, maybe not immediately, but actually will be affecting the market sooner or later. Yeah? Barring some short term or some, um, some, some small shocks along the way, but eventually the market will move this way. So that's why people always say that you must understand the economic fundamentals. Same thing when you want to invest in different counters, you also need to understand the fundamentals of the company, right? So this one we are trying to understand the fundamentals of the economy as a whole and uh, what affects the economy and therefore affects the uh, share market, yeah? the real economy and also the, uh, the stock um, market. So, okay. Um, what are we going to try to cover today are three things. One is try to understand the economic fundamentals. Yeah. Um, what are the four or five types, four or five economic fundamentals that usually has an impact on the stock market? And then we'll uh, run through quickly the potential risks from prolonged geopolitical uncertainties. And then fourthly, then we will use all our skills that we have gathered in number one and number two to try to make a good prediction for Malaysia and selected countries. Uh, I think I will be covering China, Japan, and US uh, in number three. Okay, so are we ready to go? Okay, so please put your questions if you have in the Q&A uh, Q box, I think, that's separate from the chat box. 
right? The chat box is everybody greeting each other, which is good. But the Q&A, you can put in questions and I will try to answer them if I can. Okay. All right, economic fundamentals of the market. Now, usually we all listen to like BFM or we read uh, news and then we see that it is always um, um, featured in the economic section or the share market section. All these reports, eh? analysts will report things like, oh, disappointing employment figures coming out from quarter one, uh, encouraging news on the inflation front, higher than expected industrial production growth. GDP growth is lower than expected this quarter. It's just like people who don't play football understanding, you know, the footballer punya uh, commentary or or the sports section at the end of the, uh, the the next day. Some people don't understand what is so so. What does it mean? Where do I invest? Where should I invest? Should I hold back or should I really go in uh, into the stock market at this point? So, but. This kind of announcements, why is it so important and why does it affect stock market behavior? One is we say the news effect. And the news effect, the announcements are important at the time of the announcement more than the time of it happening. Okay, The news effect is different from the actual thing happening. Yeah? For example, unemployment reported is usually from quarter one. Let's say from quarter one. So that's from January to March. But the announcement, uh, the Department of Statistics will come up with the news or the, the statistics, let's say end of April, yeah, of the fourth month, yeah, and it will come up. But the news effect goes into the stock market around at the time of the announcement. Why is that? If you want to answer, you can answer on the in the in the Q and A box also, because essentially, people are not concerned about what happened in the in that. Quarter one, yeah, from the unemployment figure of quarter one, but people are making their predictions for quarter two onwards. Yeah, so what's going to happen in April, May, June in terms of uh, when you have unemployment? It means do people have salary? Do people have uh, an optimism to be spending? Will companies get profit? You see, so you are making that news more important. Is it the news effect is more important than the actual unemployment because it helps you predict what will be the um, um, the level of economic activity in quarter two onwards. Yeah? Same thing, you worry about inflation in US, you worry about job in US. So what is it? So there's a lot of chain and chain um what we say the uh, chain effect uh, happening there for us to understand at the end of the day how does it land in the stock market. Right? But news effect is, I'm just trying to distinguish that the news effect happens going forward, although the, the, the economic activity happens prior to that. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's look at, of course, firstly, people will say economics will always start with GDP, yeah? gross domestic product, which is the total value of all goods and services in the market uh, produced in the country's boundary. It is an accurate indicator of the output of the economy, and it is still the best indicator to show economic growth yeah? because it covers everything that you produce, uh, everything that you spend on. In the in the in the geographical boundary of the country, everything would be uh, calculated already, and from the GDP, we can judge whether the economy is contracting or expanding. We look at trend, we look at percentage of growth, right? and we always usually compare. Well, in January, this January and last January was the difference. This January and December was the difference, and so on. And policymakers also are looking at the same numbers. Yeah, the economy businesses are all looking at the same GDP numbers. And economy analysts will predict and evaluate the effects of the decision because we are seeing the same numbers. So our mind is working like the policymakers' mind. We can actually predict what the policymakers will do next. So again, this is what market do. Market must catch the uh the the share. When you play in the stock market, you must be able to predict correctly what will happen. And you must time your action to be able to take advantage of whatever possible action that's going to happen from this data. Yeah. For example, if you see that inflation is happening, policymaker will do X, and then you will position yourself nicely so that it will take you will be advantageous. Yeah, you will be in an advantageous position when that X happens. Okay. 
All right. So we always, uh, having said that, we always say that GDP is not a perfect indicator. It cannot be used alone to understand market behavior. It's not very direct relationship. So we will see that just afterwards. All right. Um, I, I would like you to participate. Yeah? So please, uh, please feel free to give me a, a chat. Let me know. Uh, also, Shane, yeah? Okay, if you want. So I have prepared some quiz, small, small quiz questions for you. Okay. GDP impact also can be different at different points, at different situations, yeah? Okay, let's say our GDP data come out very chantic, very nice, okay? And uh, with that kind of GDP, then we, we, we confirm already lah that businesses are doing well. When they do well, they will hire more people. Maybe people who are already in the job, they get more salary. Consumer sentiment is very optimism. They will buy, buy, buy. Investment will exp flow in, expand, expand, expand. If that's the case, the stock market will definitely increase prices yeah, as a whole, across all counters. because um the 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 optimism is there so every counter will have a little bit of a spillover effect lah. yeah whether you are in the finished product ke, you are in the raw material business ke, along the chain everyone will get some kind of spillover effect from the business optimism yeah from the good economy that's happening so if gdp increase and it comes on the back of good business profit and all that stock market will increase okay stop market will, will be very very good now but sometimes gdp increase also yeah but business profits can fall so at what point of time or at what what scenario in the economy that this happens that even though gdp increase but business profits will eventually fall then you can predict business profits will fall yeah and when business profits fall Stock prices will fall. What kind of scenario this happens? Anyone want to answer? Or do I see where I do I see the got a chat? High interest rate, inflation. Yes, very good. Lim, PK Lim. Uh, also, yes, high interest rate. When GDP increase, but if it increase at the time where economy is already very high, that means very uh the economy is already very hot yeah that means you are already at a high level of economic activity gdp increase some more then it's almost like it's running is going to hit the uh the roof so everything that goes up must come down yeah when there's so much uh pressure on the economy people will start to predict yeah people will start to see signs of Competition for resources, competition for labor, for workers, competition. You will find that the vendors, you have to fight over your supply, uh, your supplier, because your supplier now dah ada orang baru masuk, uh, want to buy, want to have contract with them. So you have to, they want to increase price. You know, everybody will be fighting for resources, will be fighting for space in the market. Therefore, there's greater competition. And when GDP is high, usually inflation is high. I'll come to that again. When GDP is high, prices have gone up. And usually, we start another prediction, which is the government surely will not be just looking at this goyang kaki. There will be something that the government, government will take action. So that's what we call policy anticipation. It has not happened yet, but if you're smart and you can predict, yeah, you can anticipate the policy that the government will undertake in this uh, scenario with this kind of signals, then you can see that despite GDP increasing, business profits will still um, uh, be compromised. Yeah, and with with lower profit margin, the stock prices will fall. Okay, so because there will be problems with supply, there will be uh, uh, policy anticipation. Everybody gearing up to uh, what the government will do. Yeah, waiting for what the government will do. Some of them will just hold back their investments and everything. So everything becomes suddenly the GDP is going up, but you know your mindset is already prepared for 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 uh, challenges in the business uh, environment. So this happens when GDP 
increase at a time when the economy is already very, very uh, hot. Yeah, I'll just put an easy word there, very hot. Okay. The above one, when GDP is cool, is just going up. Okay, but when GDP is already, uh, when the economy is already up there, an increase in GDP will only mean that it could lead to higher costs and therefore a policy anticipation. Yeah, you anticipate policy to be something uh, drastic. All right. Okay. Now, Let's look at the actual GDP. This is nothing fancy. There's no um, econometrics time series that I have. I didn't have time to do in then, but I would really like to uh, help you see the trend, yeah, a simple trend of uh, between GDP and the stock market. So you have the GDP growth rate, and then you have the I just take FBC, uh, FBM KSCI, yeah, and these two graphs. Okay, now who can tell me? Both drop at the same time, drop in Q2, GDP Q2, drop Q1 to Q2 from 1.3% growth to negative 18% growth in Q2 2020, okay? But if you look at the timing, the market dropped first. The market dropped earlier than the GDP. So you see how powerful the effect of you know, anticipation and the psychology on the market more than it is on the on the real economy. Okay, so market dropped much higher, much faster. Uh, sorry, much earlier than the actual drop in GDP. Uh, again, the news effect came later. The market already uh, dropped. All right now, after that, um, were you able to see my cursor? My cursor, jalan jalan, to can see. Yeah? Yes, can see. Yes, okay, okay, okay. All right. So from 18%, negative 18%, then negative 3.5, negative 4.3. When you have two times negative growth, we say that the country has is going through a recession. Yeah, two consecutive negative growth is a recession. So of course, yeah, almost all countries went through a recession that time. Anyway, we went up, we went up, and then we we, we registered a growth up to 23.5% in quarter two. That is because we have a low base, yeah. The economy is already very weak. So any increase is a is a any same increase last year and this year also, still this year will become uh percentage-wise a lot more. Yeah? We call it the the low base effect because you have a low base effect. And then went down and then again went up 20%. So all these are good. But if you notice the FBM, KLCI not following the trend of the GDP. Okay, so it's going down. You look at the long trend, uh, the dotted line also, if you can see the long trend uh, line, yeah, it's also very different. Okay, the stock market continue to be negatively uh, sloped, um, but the GDP growth is showing uh, positive Slight positive slope. Okay, so again, this shows that uh, the GDP cannot predict the market alone. That's what we said just now. Yeah, GDP cannot predict the market alone. Okay, next slide. The second variable people all always watch out for will be inflation. What is the impact of inflation on the stock market? First, you have to understand two types of inflation. One is uh, demand pool. Okay, demand pool. So just imagine demand pulling from that. There means someone pulling demand, pulling price up. Okay, just imagine pulling price up. And usually that is when uh, people get from unemployed, they get employed again. Yeah, Or from no income or they get higher income. Uh, Pent up demand or, or pent up demand, like what people say after COVID-19, there's a lot of pent up demand. Uh, or you have a cycle, yeah. Whether it is the um, uh, Hari Raya cycle is too short, lah, but you have a tech cycle, technology cycle, or you have a you know um um uh, a, 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 what we say the income cycle, political cycle, you know, all that can also become uh, a, a factor for inflation inflation. Economic activity levels must be um, increasing at that time. So usually inflation always, always, always come with a high GDP rate, yeah? high GDP growth. If it doesn't, then we don't call it inflation. 
we call it stagflation or something else, you know, even more tragic, even more tragic. All right. Okay. Um, so there's an upward pressure on price because there's a lot of money going happening there. Yeah, you have economic stimulus, you have EPF withdrawals, so all this a lot of money. There's what economists will say, too much money chasing after too few goods. Uh, so it's always you, you, you hear this uh phrase a lot, too much money chasing after too few goods. That's how you can easily describe uh, um, demand pool inflation. But on the market, what's the effect? So when you have demand pool inflation, again, people who see signs of demand pool inflation will quickly create, uh, will quickly predict, yeah, anticipate that central bank will not keep um, a blind eye towards this because Central bank monitors inflation very, very much, very, very uh, closely. Yeah? They have various levels of inflation that they monitor all the time. So if there are consecutive quarters of inflation, inflation, inflation happening, um, central bank will definitely come into the picture. Okay. And usually there was you they have many um, tools that they can use to control inflation, the central bank, our bank Negara. But the one that they will use uh, often is the interest rate, yeah. Or what you, for them the tool is called the overnight policy rate. So you often hear this OPR. They will increase OPR. When OPR increase, the bank lending rates will also increase. And usually the increase is the same. Just the margin that the bank take lah. Yeah, OPR move three percent. This one got margin, and then they will move, 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 move. move. Every, everybody will move together. And then you see just now when interest rate go up. It will eat into the margin of the counters, yeah, of the product companies, and usually stock prices or the company's profit will suffer a little bit, and therefore stock prices will fall. Because it's very rare that any company in the stock market, public listed companies, which has low gearing, yeah, low uh, borrowing rate. Most of the companies have very high borrowing rates. Yeah, they are also they have equity at the same time they also have bonds yeah and so they are also paying for their loans and at the bank or paying their bonds uh paying their uh, uh commitments on the bonds you know and other things so interest rate will definitely affect our stock market uh given that these are very large companies with very likely high gearing uh ratios yeah so that's policy anticipation about interest rate. The other one is that even if you don't know how to anticipate policy, any Tom, Dick and Harry out there, when you start seeing signals of inflation, you will develop a self-protection um, psychology that people are increasing price. I need to increase price so that I can keep up when I pay for all those high prices. Okay? So anticipation or what we call in economics, anticipated inflation is much more dangerous than the inflation itself. Because when you think you want to cover yourself, if uh, I buy rice from, I not rice, lah, I buy roti chana every day from this kedai. I want to make sure my level of roti chana nurse too is the same. So if this guy increase price, I want to increase price also. So that I can enjoy my roti canai at the same level. I don't have to cut down, you see. So that self-protection uh, psychology will make you want to increase prices. But the problem with this kind of anticipated inflation is that there's no limit. You will think that, hey, they increase, berapa ya? They increase five ke? Tell, you will increase seven. And then orang lain pula increase, you know. There's really no data or no empirical evidence for that kind of psychology. You just increase, you increase, increase, everybody start increasing. The ones who usually suffer, we say, will be the ones who uh, makan gaji sama every month, every year. That one, nothing to do, not, cannot do anything. Lah. They will just have to uh, swallow uh, the price increase. Okay? So, the... The anticipation again, anticipation is the name of the game here again in in uh, in in the economy. Okay, so inflation expectation, policy uh, expectation, yeah, policy anticipation. Um, um, if you're interested about the interest rate, inflate, 
because if the bank charge a nominal interest rate of 6%, tolak inflation rate 4%, that means real interest rate that they are earning is only 2%. Okay, so again, banks also will play the uh, self-protection um, kind of um, method. Yeah, they will try to make sure that their, their welfare is covered in that sense. Okay. All right, let's look at the second type of inflation. This is cost push. Okay, let's look at the gamba, uh, the, the picture on the right first. Uh, helium price, helium is used to uh, you know, give the balloon the air to go, kan, go up. So if helium price doubled, balloon price doubled. Okay, so the balloon price did not double because many children want the balloon. That is demand push. Oh, sorry, demand pool. Yeah, the balloon price here went up because helium price went up. But you think this is proportionate? Helium night twice, balloon also must night twice. It's a bit pening, right? Because we don't know, like, in fact, the dia buat macam tu. So again, this is the anticipation. They will say, oh, my cost go up, will increase. Some companies are able to absorb. So you, when you listen to the company representative talking, they will say, like, yeah, yeah, we got price increase. We have problems in the supply chain. Uh, we have challenges there, but we are able to absorb from other um, sources. If they openly say that they are able to absorb, then that means they are not going to pass on the price uh, increase to the consumers. Okay, But some companies will silently just you know, uh, double whether it's fairly proportionate or not. So cost push uh, has a few reasons also. Um, uh, it's because of high commodity prices, especially if like you're producing food. Yeah, so food, your commodity that you worry about will be wheat, yeah, soya, rice, sugar. These are all important. And remember, Malaysia is a net importer, a net food importer country. Yeah. High commodity prices is also, of course, always oil. Yeah? Okay, disruption to local value chain. If let's say there's climate uh, issue, too hot, uh, not enough water, or there's a problem with jalan runtuh, you know, anything, lah, local value chain. Yeah? Trade disruption, uh, there's been um, um, a trade permit, yeah? or company close uh, or there is a problem from for raw materials from other countries and whatnot is always an issue depreciation of uh, ringgit okay especially if the goods have a high proportion of foreign uh, raw materials uh, or foreign expertise that's needed uh, foreign labor that's needed also um, then uh, the ringgit will be affected yeah, policy uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen with if the subsidy targeting. So there's a lot of policy uncertainty. Maybe this will push that mentality, the anticipation up as well. Higher transportation and labor costs. Yeah, uh, oil prices uh, will be an issue. Tax on income, tax on consumption, or tax on production. So we recently uh, have the SST uh, going up to eight percent, and then we have the low low value goods tax like L LVGT 10%. Okay. Um electric electricity tariff is still going to be adjusted. We're waiting for that. Water tariff is also going to be adjusted. Uh even waste garbage also they say you know garbage collection also is going to be um uh, is going to be uh, adjusted. So we'll see in the second half of 2024 many analysts say 2024 the, the subsidy rationalization will only take effect uh, beginning of Q2. You know, that's that's probably the earliest that they can do any. So we'll see what happens uh, on the cost push side. Yeah. Okay. So how do let's see when what do we uh, uh what is the policy reaction for cost push? Okay. When you have cost push, uh remember cost push is Inflation that affects cost of production, right? So, um, one of the cost of production is always interest because companies borrow, right? So, it does not make sense to solve cost push inflation by increasing interest rate because interest rate is also cost in the company's production um, uh, profile. Yeah. So, policy anticipation 
the means policy that the government should be doing when you have a clear cost push inflation case is to reduce tax, to make all these things easier. Mm. Lah. That means to make all to make the production cost go down quickly. Yeah. Whether you open new market uh, or new trade agreements so that you get uh, new supply, cheaper supply, you reduce tax, you reduce regulations, you increase R&D, whatever you can replace, artificial, artificial, whatever, you increase skills, you know. All these are called supply-side policy because cost is on the, cost push just now is on the supply-side story, okay? So the policy anticipation is actually supply-side uh, policies, all right? But the inflation expectation happened that juga? Ah, uh, happen. Uh, they happen some like the demand push the sound. You know, people still want to protect themselves when they have uh signs or they have um they 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 think that inflation is going to spiral uh uncontrollably in the future. So they have to put on their safety mechanisms as well. Okay. Now the problem with supply side policy is that usually this kind of policies take very long to implement uh, sorry take, it it can be very fast to implement but it takes very long to show any results to actually reduce the cost issue that we had just now okay maybe some will be effective like if you cannot buy from uh, china for instance certain raw materials you buy from quickly from vietnam if you can quickly resolve that supply issue then maybe you don't have cost push for a long time but Usually, it's very hard to just resolve your cost push uh, story uh, or you or very hard to resolve them with good results quickly. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So, stock prices uh, will go up if the supply side policies are successful. Okay. Because at the end of the day, all the supply side policy is to increase the uh, positive environment for businesses make them more productive and so on. So you see or not why my arrow is very small compared to that. That's why my arrow is small because it's, it takes a long time and the effect is sometimes very far, far. We don't know really. It will be dispersed, diverging, you know, and so on. So stock price to tak lah clearly will re really go up uh, at the same time. Okay. Eh? I'm going to just quickly... Um, ah. Okay, I'll look at the question and answer. I'll, I'll go straight and answer Shahril Shaharoni's question. Can demand pull and cost push happen at the same time? Ah, so yang ini is your quiz question. Your $1 million question. Shane would like to answer this question. Like, okay, Shane. No, 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 I, I, you must I, kalau you betul. no, not that I want to answer the question. Just that I want to mark that it has been addressed. <laughs> oh, I see, I see. Okay, okay. So, so please go ahead and answer the question. What's the question? Please, anyone? Uh, what's the answer? Sorry. Anybody want to try? What is happening now? Uh, I think during the pandemic, we see that the supply chain was disrupted. So there, there were cost push factor. Yeah, okay. that was that was definitely COVID. Yeah. Now, but now, I think in in America the demand pool is uh, pretty strong with consumption. Uh, you know, consumer consumption is still at um, uh, you know, yeah. surging. Uh, Malaysia's side, I think I leave it to doctor <laughs> to uh, to answer that. <laughs> Anybody else wants to answer? What do you think is happening your... now? Cost push or demand push? Yeah, type your response. Uh, helium ka uh, or the trolley one? Which one? 19, 2024. This month, what? March? Uh? Is it 2024? What's happening? Uh, which of this inflation is happening now? Cost push. Okay, many people say cost push. Ah. Uh, the problem is, oh, banyak orang nak jawab. Oh, 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 banyak orang jawab. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> the problem now is that both are happening at the same time. Okay, we both are happening at the same time, and it's almost impossible to track how many coming from the cost push side 
yeah, all the issues that you mentioned as well, and how much, how many percentage is coming from the demand pool. Because remember, after COVID, we had all these stimulus, all these, um, uh, all these upper EPF withdrawal, all these uh, stimulus packages and all that. So there's a lot of pent up, and pent up uh, demand will take time to be satisfied. Yeah, so some of the pent up demand is still happening now. People are crazy about makan kat luar, about going on holidays, about buying all those things. And then people who got new jobs, they want to spend. Then, so there's a lot of pent up demand, pent up uh, um, income opportunities coming out there. But at the same time, we have the energy issue, we have the um, uh, shipping issues happening. So we have both cost push and we have, of course, the exchange rate. Someone mentioned that just now. We have both the cost push issues happening as well as the demand. So, all right. So that's why, what do you think the Banagara will, which policy the Banagara will use? The supply side policy? The government will use the supply side policy, which is Ministry of uh, Finance, or the money side, the demand side policy, uh, uh, which is the interest rate. Result. Which one will they use? Uh, because it's difficult to distinguish between cost push and inflation, what the government will do is just to assume that everything is, uh, everything can be solved by interest rate. So that's why they took that decision to increase the OPR. Okay, because supply side policy has its challenges. It's good policies, but it's structural. That means you have to do it from the, you know, you have to really uproot everything and do everything properly. So you have more skills to change the education, you know, and all this lot of things. What trade agreement, baru, and all that. But interest rate you can implement tomorrow. Or every time the the Benegara committee meets, yeah, and interest rate is what we call a blunt tool. You cannot, uh, they cannot catch yang jahat jahat. You cannot catch the naughty naughty ones only. They cannot catch the sectors or the people who make this crazy, you know, predictions. You know? They cannot do that. They everyone will be affected whether or not you are a wage earner whether you are a businessman whether you are a speculator everyone will be affected it's a plan too yeah semua sekali kena yeah interest rate so because the bank negara's assumption is that to be on the safe side we better implement something that is broad based and that will have a medium to long term effect get medium to long term effect may not happen immediately but it has that uh, that effect. All right. Okay. Kenapa ada komen? Banyak negara increase interest rate lah. Kennedy. Huh? When you cannot distinguish and most likely it is also demand more, more also cost. The decision is to use interest rate. Interest rate is a blunt tool. It will affect everybody. And it will give a long term effect. Medium to long term Effect. Yeah. Right. Now let's look at the actual uh, just trend trend uh, time trend graph. Yeah, nothing fancy. So I said just now. So you can see. Hello, am I frozen? No, eh? Can I? Okay. You can yeah, see the SBM, KLCI. Oh, look. Okay. You can see CPI. Can you see CPI? CPI core. Core CPI, core inflation. Core inflation is what uh, Ben Negara will monitor mostly. Yeah, core inflation. And you can see food inflation or not. Food inflation always higher than our core inflation. Okay. Core inflation are the inflation that does not include fresh food. I think fresh food and energy. Um, what are the two things? Yeah, they don't include. Uh, there are only two things not included in the everything else is included in the core. But if you take just core food, uh, sorry, food inflation, food inflation is much more volatile, yeah, much more ganas, lah, as you can see, yeah, from the core inflation. But Ben Negara will observe core inflation. Why? Because core inflation is much more uh, consistent. 
People on the street always ask me, why food inflation, food, 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 food price very high? But government is not doing enough because Bank Negara will only, uh, usually will look at core inflation because core inflation is much more, what we say, um, is much more representative of the whole economy. Food and energy in any country, they are memang wild scale. Yeah, so you cannot follow food and uh, energy all the time because they are always volatile for a lot of reasons. So they are what we call um, short-term white noise. No, 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 no. So what you need to find is where is the actual broad trend of the inflation uh, that is shown by the core uh, inflation. Okay. So what you observe, FBMCI, uh, K, sorry, KLCI punya uh, long-term trend ke bawah kan negative slope uh, core inflation dia ke ke atas so betul tak our theory just now if inflation is high let's go back so this one kan inflation is high the policy that will happen following inflation will be higher interest rate higher interest rate will eat up cost of uh, margin uh, and most counters will suffer then and consumer uh, sentiments will also suffer. So stock prices will likely fall. So okay. Kena tak dengan teori tadi? Kena kan? Give me some thumbs up if you see that. Uh, because after this, you will all be master at prediction. <laughs> Making your own outlooks already after this. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so it has an inverse relationship. Uh, and mostly because of the interest rate uh, policy here. Yeah? All right. Okay, the third variable we want to look at is impact of unemployment. What's it? Like impact on unemployment. When unemployment falls, it means that people are getting jobs, right? And usually when people get jobs, a lot of people get money, a lot of people get higher salary. Uh, again, it signals... Um, heating out of the economy and policy anticipation will kick in, interest rate uh, will actually kick in also. So yeah, central bank will actually do the increase in interest rate and therefore stock prices will fall. Okay, same like just now. Uh, so we see that when interest uh, in, the, in the graph, the stock market went down at about the same time, COVID-19. At that time, unemployment rose to the highest level. Yeah, in recent memory, lah, yeah? uh, up to 5% at that time. And then when it fell, uh, the KL uh, CI index also fell, unemployment fell. Now it's stabilizing at about uh, 3%. Okay, But we are still worried about the unemployment issue because the employment that's happening also not really good employment. You know? We worry about income that these people are making. But um, uh, on the number side, Yes, we have less unemployment at the moment. Okay, stabilizing at 3%. Ah, this one most interesting to you, I think. Okay, impact of exchange rate on the stock market. Ah, this one very straightforward. There are two ways stock market is related to exchange rate. One is when the stock market is doing well, exchange, we, we look at different direction, dari kiri ke kanan, kanan ke kiri. Ya. Okay, let's look, start with this one. Stock market, stock market doing well, Exchange rate will go up. So there are two markets we're talking about: the stock market and the forex market. Stock market go up, the forex demand, uh, the the market demand for ringgit will go up also. Why? Because outsiders, uh, will want to participate in our stock market. Okay, that's one reason. Right. So there's the demand. From uh, and Malaysia is have always been on one uh, in the list of emerging countries that has performed, uh, emerging markets has performed well. So it's always on the radar of uh, foreign or fund investors overseas. Yeah. So if our stock market do well, people will buy ringgit so that they can invest in the stock market. So our exchange rate will go up because of that demand. All right. So that's one type of relationship. But if stock market, uh, sorry, if exchange second second uh, type is, if exchange rate naik, then what happens to the stock market? Ah, ini susah sikit. 
Uh, it will depend on the counters. If your counter that you are eyeing, you know, the counter that you not focus on, they have a lot of export. Um, the composition of their revenue comes from export. Uh, then you will have what? Good or bad year? Good or bad year? Kalau you have a lot of export uh, customers, you, you export to a lot of countries. Good year, kan? Because your goods are cheaper. Yes, your goods are cheaper to them. You don't have to pay, you don't have to reduce price. You're not reducing anything. It's just that they find our goods cheaper because our exchange rate is lower. You don't have to reduce anything. You just feel like, but they find it, wow, jump buy from Malaysia, let's shift from Indonesia and buy from Malaysia. You know, that kind of thing. So you'll have a good year. But if your counter yeah, or the stock that you're eyeing has an import dependent, it has a lot of import raw materials, yeah, then you might be in trouble yeah, because your raw materials will have to be paid um, with the other currency, whatever the other currency. And your currency now is low. Okay. So the same thing, proportion of the stock market as a whole. How many counters in Malaysia has an international operation? In the KLCI, has international operation. That means anything that happens to their exchange rate, to the exchange rate of Malaysia will be very, very uh, influential. Yeah? So that's why Ben Negara said, GLC and GLIC, because these are people who have a lot of international operations. They keep money outside. Uh, they are the ones that can help boost uh, the forex market again by buying ringgit okay because they have international operations they have international reserves okay like one example i can bring you uh, when uk had that brexit kan dia punya stock market actually uh, dia punya exchange rate turun kan tapi many companies in the punya stock market are happy because they have international operations so dia tak ada masalah it depends on the counter right the second thing is that, again, policy anticipation. What do you think the Ben Negara will do? Ben Negara will protect the exchange rate or just keep quiet? If they protect, they protect macam mana? If they tak protect, they tak protect too, what, and then what will happen? Okay? All right. So I will show you afterwards the policy that center, that Ben Negara can do to protect the currency will again be the interest rate. All right. But before that, let's go through some of the factors that cause a currency to decline. So like Malaysia, and you try to think, huh, Malaysia. So I have to run very fast because we have only a few minutes left. When you have trade imbalance, uh, your current account surplus, you export too much or you, sorry, you import too much compared to your export. Uh, then it shows that the company will have a currency issue. Logic lah kan? Because you buy too much from outside, you have a currency issue. If your productivity and competitiveness is lacking, you have economic slump lacking, currency will fall also. If you have political uncertainty, people don't know whether they should keep their business in that country or not, or they should keep their money in that ringgit or not. It's not a, it's not a strong uh, or reliable store of value anymore, then they will get out. Even locals also will get their money out and into another currency, right? Okay, that's number four. Relatively low interest rate is not interesting to buy any or invest in Malaysia anymore. If that's if that's the case, yeah, relatively low interest rate. Domestic inflation, domestic inflation is a bad thing. If it is there is inflation, that means our cost of production is high. We can't produce with a good margin. Yeah, our currency will decline. If people buy more, okay lah. If people don't buy more, you know, everything will still be bad. Uh, number seven is always something that we worry about. Movement of other currencies. Uh, as you know, US appreciate for reasons. US appreciate for certain reasons. And that reason caused our currency to depreciate. We cannot separate the two because you buy ringgit with US, you buy US with ringgit. So even if nothing happens in Malaysia, one, two, three, four, five, six, and eight, nothing happened. If US move by one inch, we will move the other way by one inch, even in the best, best, best situation. 
because that's the nature of the market. You can you buy with the other currency. You get what I mean? So if let's say people want to buy US because the interest rate there is high or because the, um, the president has announced a very good positive economic package, uh, people like it, bond price goes down, even fixed deposit go up, whatever like the reason that US is suddenly uh, paradise, yeah? They move one inch up, we move one inch down. Catherine's Paribus, whatever else happened, even in the best of situations. So this is what we have to understand. The absolute decline, absolute decline, maybe our productivity, our you know, economic GDP, there is absolute decline. The other one is a relative decline of our currency against the other currency. I hope you can understand at least by, by, by the end of this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right. So if I ask you which one is relative decline, which one is absolute decline because of us? The absolute one is one, two, three, four, five, six, tada. Because of us. That people don't have confidence. We also don't have confidence. all those things. Lah. But the ones that's not absolute, not that is relative to other people, uh, what other people are doing in the market will be seven and eight. Okay, so that's why going back to the GDP uh, graph awal-awal tadi, even if GDP go up, you see that the KLCI is not reacting because it could be that they have another issue to worry about, which is the currency. Okay. All right. If you compare, compare kan, this one, US, kita dengan USD, F, uh, again, FB, this is the same graph. Eh? KLCI, FBM to sama, going down. But USD going up, going up, going up, kan? Singapore also going up. Because Singapore pandai, dia naikkan interest rate dia. So, dia punya currency also protected. At the same, you know, so that they keep up with US. We know that they have a tagging system with US. Yeah? Currency tag with US. So, dia sama trend. So, the opposite can happen. Uh, exchange rate. Uh, uh, exchange rate kita turun when it go up it turun then this one will also turun okay you compare with euro euro pun sama juga upward trend but not as bad as US just now Japan tak Japan tak follow US because Japan cannot play the same game just to cannot play the interest rate game whatever game just to keep up with US Japan has got its own problem Cannot do much. So Japan punya trend dengan Malaysia, dengan ringgit, tengok dia sama. Dia turun juga. Okay, that means dia tak react. Dia tak ambil kesempatan ataupun dia tak follow sama dengan uh, USD, MYR punya um, rate tadi. Okay, you can ask me a question. I will try to answer later slow-slow. Right? Now, kita tengok China. China Yuan. Okay, tengok China Yuan. Apa kita rasa? China yang mana? Naik atas sikit. Uh, China also same thing. They will try to, they, they do want to play the, they do want to control their currency, but they have their internal problems that makes it a bit limited for them to react. So that's why they 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 have their own problems with US, uh, punya exchange rate. Yeah? Japan also, you, the news came out today, they are very concerned that they are, exchange rate is very weak against us so that means they are not playing that game like you know they are not they are not controlling their currency in a sense or they have very limited place to control their currency just to keep up with what's happening in us okay all right so let's go down to the to the real real story here the stock market actually is very much influenced by what happens to the interest rate and just now I've shown you all the all the belakang into the the apa kata orang the behind the scene story kan. Uh, tapi once you come to this, once you get interest rate naik, usually what will happen is that top prices will fall because of this one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, borrowing is expensive, earnings is uh reduced. And, but there are sectors, there are sectors in the stock market that will be very happy when interest rate naik. Cuba teka. Okay lah, nanti you tekel lah. 
Yes, banks will be very happy. High dividend sectors, uh, uh, companies will be very happy. Yeah. Um, yang happy kalau interest rate turun will be consumer, retail, kan? Uh, yang lain tu will be, they will be happy. Right? So that why also you have to follow sectoral analysis which we can't do today. Okay, further policy anticipation, further inflation expectation. Yeah, it's, that's why we say inflation is a spiral. It's an animal that just go up and up and up. We don't know when it will stop. All right. So let's look at Bank Negara Monetary Policy Committee. Uh, that committee which decides whether to bring up or down our OPR. Now, when we uh, were hit by COVID and the economy was very rocky, kan? Uh, the lockdown and all that. So in order to make people um, uh, to ease the hardship during that time, Bank Negara reduced OPR from 3% to 1.7% in very short successions. Yeah? 25 basis point boom, 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 boom. in every two months, every time they meet, they reduce, 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 reduce. And then they kept it at 1.75 for about a year, yeah, almost a year, on 2020, almost two years. Yeah. And then beginning May 2022, all this pent up demand, the cost push, semua yang tadi kita kata tadi dah start showing signs of inflation. And the policy reaction is to increase interest rate. So they start increasing interest rate in May 2022. Every two months, jumpa naik, 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 naik. Last kali naik is at May 23. So imagine five times naik from May 22 to May 23. If you ask people on the ground, that's why they feel, ayo, sakit kepala, sakit kepala, OPR. Because it is, it has never, it's very rarely that it happens, you know, that the central bank, meet je naik, meet je naik. Because they are trying to catch inflation. They are trying to subdue, not tame the inflation. So every time they meet, they see the signs. They, we need to do more. We need to do more. We need to do more. And finally, May 2023, and since May 2023 until today, yeah, the most recent March meeting also, they said we'll keep it. Because if we increase it further, uh, people will feel the unbearable. Dah, nanti. Yeah, so we'll keep it. We want to keep the economy still growing. Uh, so we'll 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 keep and we'll KIV it a little bit more. Okay. So OPR went up uh, five times, yeah, 125 basis points in just a year. Okay. But this is worse uh, in the US and other countries. Yeah, they drop a lot more and then they went up a lot faster. Uh, so our Venegara is actually quite prudent uh, in that sense. Okay. Um, let me see. Banyak komen ni. Oh, pandai-pandai. Semua. I have got very good students. Very good. Okay. Foreign interest rate. Tadi interest rate kita. Huh? Our local interest rate. What about foreign interest rate? Foreign interest rate and the stock market. If US interest rate go up, what happened? US interest rate. Go up also, our stock will go down. Okay. The reason usually uh, uh, given is what we call the interest rate differential. Right. People are more interested to take advantage of the higher interest rate there uh, compared to Malaysia where the interest rate is low. Yeah? So they will invest. People usually switch from equity to bonds. Right. Uh, or they just switch from anything yeah? any any kind of um, interest bearing instrument because when interest rate is high you lock in that interest price yeah that interest rate you're you're good to go okay so selling the ringgit to invest in where the high interest rate returns uh, still prevail and um, so the so we as Malaysians we now have to also anticipate not just our interest rate policy but also the U.S. interest rate policy, and also other countries around us, for that matter. Yeah, but maybe U.S. still is, is the biggest uh, market, um, you yeah, know, and foreign uh, investment place. So okay, we look at U.S. interest rate. So everybody wait lah, tiga bulan sekali we wait for the FOMC punya uh, decision and whatnot. What's the latest decision to hold kan? But let me show you the interest rate. Yang ni tadi I kata tadi. Uh, when COVID happened, merah tu, the merah one is a Fed funds. 
Okay. When COVID happened, their interest rate went down. Okay. They actually lower than us also at that time. They lower and then they went down. They went down and to 0 0.25, if I'm not mistaken. Is it negative? I, I can't recall. But they went down they were faster. They maintained until April 2022. They moved up, 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 up. Up, 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 sangat. Okay. So, if you see, they, they are now at 5.7, 5. Uh, what do you know? 5.5, I think. Yeah, They were at the 5.5. From a very low uh, rate, uh, I think close to zero, if I'm not mistaken, during COVID. So, they are putting a very steep increase. So, with this steep increase, Cannot blame people to be attracted to go and invest in US. If you see the right side, punya graph, you see the interest rate differential. For the longest time, we have a higher interest rate than them. And then with from July 2022 onwards, they have this huge uh, interest rate, positive interest rate differentials against us. Yeah, so it is most felt uh, after that. And then if we check the financial outflow, capital flight data from the bursa flight data, memang betul. Quarter four, quarter three, uh, very high uh, net outflow foreign capital flight. Yeah, quarter four, quarter three onwards. Uh, during that time. Okay, all right. So that's the end of section two. Let me see what question I can. I think okay, we'll address Darshan. a question later on. You want to address ah, okay. We'll address question later. Okay, let's look at yeah, geopolitics. Yes, we got a few sections to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, what does it all mean? Now that you have 101 on all the fundamentals, yeah, there's no perfect science to the relationship between stock market, the stocks and market uh, economy. Yeah. So there are fundamentals. But if we only have fundamentals, then everything can be predicted. Betul tak? Can. But we don't have... We cannot just rely on the fundamentals as also understanding the psychology of the investor, psychology of the market. Yeah, uh, Not just we want to catch what the policymaker will be doing, we also want to catch and understand what the other investors will be doing, not just in Malaysia, but also in other uh, markets. All right, But still, it is still a safe bet to always look at the economic fundamentals so that you see where you are going. You're not making... Um, a really risky, risky, risky thing because it reduces the risk a bit when you understand the fundamentals and where the direction is going to take you. It's just that you must understand, even though the fundamental may say that it will go up, it will go down, yeah, sometimes they take longer to react. Um, there's a lagger effect, there's a long term, and a tengah jalan got something kacau lagi, you know, so it's not really that straightforward because we're not living in the lab, we're living in the real world. Okay, so speaking of the real world, we go to the second section, geopolitical risks. Okay. Geopolitical risks, people talk geopolitical, geopolitical. Geopolitical ini sebenarnya is just any risk that does not originate from inside your country. Okay. Any risk that does not originate from inside your country. So it can be a global economic slowdown. It comes from another geography region. Yeah. A global economic slowdown, it can be the US actions on their interest rate, supply chain, conflict, elections, political changes, domestic challenges, climate related issues, artificial intelligence related challenges also, which I will speak to uh, in a few moments. Potential risk from geopolitics. Yeah? Geopolitics, ni, uh, of course, you know, Russia, Ukraine. Now, Ukraine, uh, um, I, I think you, you also know that Putin is uh, re-elected. You know how many years he has been president? 23 years. Okay, So in an election year like this year, he's not going to let go of Ukraine very easily. He's, he's going to be his sixth term already. So he's going to make it a beautiful year so that people will... You know, get what I mean or not? And... Ukraine is trying to fight back as much as possible, but economically there will be some effects on the commodity yeah, that Ukraine and Russia are producing, oil and also wheat, and then um, 
yeah, and and whatever that comes between, yeah, because Ukraine is the as you know is the uh, bread basket of the Euro of Europe. Okay, Israel and Hamas, we know the conflict. We also know that the one of the spillover effect is the uh, boycott. Okay, so. Uh, Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, so there's a boycott uh, issue and we must, if we want to really know which counter young will be affected and then if that counter is in US or in other countries, how is it linked as a supplier or a, or a buyer to our local counters? Uh, semua tu memang lagi susah nak kena, kena, kena study lah. Yeah? North Korea uh continued missile testing lah and everything china taiwan got a new president uh, not very friendly to china so the tension will still go on asia pacific has got a few issues um um trade chains and uh, trade uh, issues as well iran and us proxy war us and uk houthi and somalia now why they are important on the share market two things two things only not two things only lah, but two things. One is a commodity, yeah, including oil. The dua ialah the shipping cost. Okay, especially Iran, uh, and also the Somalia, all right. Uh, even uh, even the Suez Canal tu, they are the masalah cukup air. You know, the water levels went down. Even that also has caused problem. What more if you have a conflict in that area? Okay, ship cannot pass through as fast as possible. The, um, now that they want, to, now they want to create a new shipping line down to Cape of Good Hope, got South Africa, but that will cost them an extra two months, and that will cost them even more fuel. You know, so these kind of things we need to observe these two. Yeah, the effect on commodity, the effect on uh, oil prices. Potential risk from economic nationalism. Uh, economic nationalism also <laughs> kena juga to, uh, because economic nationalism means that we are holding to our brass, tak nak jual. India holds to their brass. Or Indonesia holds to Vietnam, or China holds to What happens to other countries? Susah juga kan? Uh, so that's why economic nationalism ni is something that you need to look out for also. Uh, because when countries protect domestic industries, they will discriminate against the international companies. That's one. All right. So if our company like Petronas is in another country, uh, or that country is in another, you know, that kind of thing, they will be discriminated from through whatever reason, tariff, ke, permit, ke, and, and so on. We're also going to have to keep an eye on the green incentive. Yeah. Green incentive ni banyak tax incentive that, uh, that the governments are giving to make sure the green transition happens, okay, to, to, to promote or to motivate the green transition. But when you have a green transition and the market is not ready, then what you have will be over, oversupply, okay, uh, oversupply. And then again, where is that going to go? Who's going to be affected? How is the government going to absorb that overcapacity uh, uh, and so on? Uh, CBAM, uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism is going to add cost to the companies exporting to EU because it is a list of uh, conditions in order to export to EU uh, for carbon border adjustment mechanism. All right, four and five. China is trying to, re to, to get a bigger role for Yuan as the reserve currency in the um, IMF SDR. You know, so they are already one of the biggest currencies used, the largest uh, type of currency used in the world, but they are going to make it even more prominent um, um, for, for various reasons that we don't have time to go through that. Number five is also interesting, using alternative currencies in international trade. So all this will affect our currency just now, can I do that again? Alternative currency, I think our PM have spoken to many countries in his visits, let's try to trade using our local currency. Let's not try to use US. Okay, so among uh, uh, bilateral trades like with Thailand and all that, it is settled. There's a payment framework that uses local currency. So that kind of trend is 
uh, gaining traction in many regions. Uh, so we will see that the effect of US appreciation, depreciation will not be as clear cut macam tadi, yeah? uh, because of this um, because of these alternatives that people are taking. Okay. Climate change, I don't need to take, uh, talk much about this. You know, um, commodity price, consumer, greenwashing. And just now I spoke about Panama Canal's ongoing drought. These are all climate change uh, example. Potential risk from AI. Okay, AI need new. Potential risk from AI is actually good for business. Business that uses AI will be able to, you know, um, sharpen their marketing, uh, sharpen their product uh, um, efficiency, and, and so on. However, AI comes with its own challenges, yeah? social, legal, uh, cultural challenges. And when the challenges come, get to a point, you will start to anticipate that, again, can government tengok aja. AI, government must do something. People also will say, government must do something. Otherwise, AI is destroying us. Can. There's a lot of propaganda. There's a lot of public discussion about AI. So the government will do something um, eventually. And in some countries, government has already taken action. They have uh, increased regulatory uh, measures. They have required all sorts of things. And when that happens, it will be higher compliance cost. Okay, there will be a lot of um, then just a straightforward when your kind of business, there will be a lot of higher compliance costs on this added AI regulations, yeah, related regulations. There could be barriers of entry also because government is cautious, the market is cautious. And then AI it can be a double edged sword. So, yeah, it can make your business better or get you all the marketing, all the new customers. But it can also be so easy to defame you or to make your company look bad. Right? To the extent that we don't know who is right anymore uh, and who to trust anymore. The, and, and people will start speculating, speculating, speculating. So we worry that uh, it will erode policy effectiveness. So the line is not so clear cut anymore. And institutional credibility will also be um, a lot of greenwashing, a lot of social washing, whatever washing lah, that, that needs to be done because of the disruption that comes from the AI uh, technology. So these are some of the challenges we just need to uh, be be, be um, ready for. Yeah? All right. So now we come to the prediction. <laughs> now we come to economic outlook. Okay. Uh, to ada orang lega dah, dah sampai dah ke economic outlook. So I'll bring a few economic outlook reports yeah, from IMF. Uh, this one was produced January 2024. Growth and productivity uh, projected at 3.1%. Still below, okay. Just, just try to tangka apa yang you nampak. Eh? I already summarized it, but you still need to tangka what you can. So growth and productivity still below historical average. Okay, low line productivity, low underlying productivity growth, but then you're not strong enough. Government policies, some central banks are still increasing policy rates to fight inflation. That means they still have to bergaduh dengan inflation. They still have to, you know, combat inflation. And then some governments have started to withdraw fiscal support. Yeah? Because uh, after COVID, they spend a lot of money and then you know the fiscal constraint is catching up. Lah. Many countries that are agak susah nak, nak maintain the same kind of support. Um, um, so to avoid higher debt GDP ratios. Yeah? Um, so fiscal support is also going undergoing a lot of adjustments. Inflation expected to fall, yes, because even though there's a lot of pent-up energy right after COVID, tapi pent-up-pent-up pun -up -pent -up sekarang ni dah kurang lah, dah, 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 mostly dah dapat dah lah, you know, so now it's, it's stabilizing, it's not so semangat sangat like after the COVID, now it's stabilizing. Um, so that's why inflation and the call, uh, and the demand push is also, we, we expect it to be uh, uh, stabilizing. The question is whether kalau pun st stabilizing, how fast will the central bank reduce interest rate? How fast will the policy uh, change happen? Okay, because central banks are known to be very conservative. Uh, so like what happened uh, last week, people so excited, 
Oh, stock naik, naik, naik. Semangat ingatkan Fed will cut. Tengok-tengok Fed tak cut. Kan? Uh, so, uh, everybody is betting that Fed will cut this time. But, 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 so, uh, we'll see. Yeah. And inflation can also suddenly come from new geopolitical shocks or escalating geopolitical shocks. Yeah. So, we also look at that. So, ini tiga benda. See what you can extract. Jeng, jeng, jeng. Jeng, 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 jeng. Okay. Growth projection by region, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Asia mana? Ah. Actually, the global growth is actually supported by Asia lah. All the time. Every year pun like that. Yeah. The global growth is pulled by the growth in the Asia region. Okay, this one OECD economy outlook. Produced November 2023. Ah, dia punya global growth projection lagi teruk, 2.7. There's now 3. And then it's dependent, dependent on fast-growing Asian economies. If there are no large, further large shocks to food and energy prices, kalau no more shocks to food and energy prices, inflation can return to normal. But still advise to keep a restrictive policy. That means to keep a high interest rate policy. Public debt to GDP ratio now very high. Ini fiscal tadi. Yeah? Fiscal adjustment still needs to happen. Future challenges, most countries have to deal with aging societies, climate change, weak trade growth yeah, relative to GDP. GDP naik, tapi trade is not happening. So, you know, it, it, something's not really um, as usual yet. Lah, yeah? It's not really business as usual yet. World Bank pula, dia punya report projected at 2.4. In 2024, 2024 decline actually. They still predict uh, tight monetary policy around the world. They still predict low levels of trade and investment. Conflict in the Middle East and also Ukraine uh, is still on top of their list of worries. Yeah, so that's global outlook. Okay, now US. Let's go to US. Yes, we are so sayang dengan US. Mana the US today? Okay, inflation will likely fall, right? There's already signs that inflation is supposed to fall, baru-baru ni. But when it didn't, that's why uh, the FOMC decided to not uh, reduce the interest rate. But the way that it's, it's happening, inflation too will definitely fall this year. And in fact, some economies are already seeing signs that inflation too will fall, fall, fall. US silap-silap hari bulan could go into a, a recession. Okay? Because they have been um, suffering from a lot of high interest rate effects very intensely. And so when inflation, inflation they just spiral upwards pun dia macam tu, they spiral downwards pun macam tu. They cannot control, they don't know when to stop. Okay? You have to change the optimism, pessimism. Kalau dia nak turun, you can turun. You cannot, you cannot stop it. You naik, dia can naik macam tu. So, if it falls and continues to fall, there are concerns that US can even go into a recession uh, sometime end of the year or something. Yeah. All right. Geopolitical shocks. US is everywhere. So, of course, there's going to be a conflict regarding oil and gas market at least on the shipping, uh, the effect on shipping and also oil prices. So Edelman, for instance, uh, predict that US growth projection is around 2%, which is okay for a big country, is about 2 to 3% for okay. Okay. Uh, China uh, problem now is because we know low consumption, depressed housing market, we've heard about that. High unemployment rates. Unemployment rates, they are about 5.3% just in the cities. But because it's such a big country, so it's 400 million, you know, so up to up to 400 million by some estimates. And this is not good. Yeah. Uh, but China has, uh, has announced a policy that they will create 12 million jobs in one year, in one place. No, so they have policies in place to address this. Okay. Uh, 2023 growth is expected around five, yeah, and this is the government number. Um, they will pursue high quality rather than high quantity growth. You know, you know, China has always been high, double digit, double digit, very high, high, high growth. But now I think the government is using this, uh, this time to actually pursue 
higher quality growth, more sustainable type of growth uh, instead of running with a high target, quantity target. Yeah. Um, we are anticipating that China will use all the policy it has, including low interest rate, to help the economy rebound. Um, foreign direct investments is likely a KIV game. Yeah, government may come up with policies, so everybody's work, looking at government for their policies before they come in, because um, yeah, they want to see more signs, yeah, more positive signs. Um, the interest, their their OPR, they panggil lagi, they panggil loan prime rate. I think so. Their OPR is about three point four five percent, three point four percent, something like that. So it's it's good, it's good. Yeah, okay. Now Japan, Japan dah memang zero nominal growth for so long. Yeah, but there are signs that um the the economy is growing. There are signs that nominal growth is turning. There are signs that there are increasing investment. There are increasing new types of technology. Yeah? And there's reskilling, human capital. But their problem is that as a high developed country, they are very close with China and US. And whatever happens to these big, big companies will also uh, affect them. Okay. Um, Overnight policy rate, the overnight policy rate as well. China is a case yang I kata dia limited area, limited space. Dia ni nak nak turun lagi, nak boost the economy, you turunkan interest rate kan. But Japan is the only country, not the only, very few country that has a negative interest rate. Maknanya, uh, it's like this. If you keep money with me, I don't give you interest rate, I charge you interest rate. There's a negative interest rate. Because they don't want the money to stay in the banks. They want you to use the money to boost the economy. So they have been implementing in the past eight years this negative interest rate. All right? So how can they reduce any more? Um, what they did recently last week was they increased the to become zero. So from negative to become zero interest rate. That's a sign that they are also worried about inflation lah because they increase kan. Tapi increase to zero. They dare not increase it higher because the economy is so weak that anything you do, it will be so sensitive that the economy might just stagnate again. Yeah, so we are keeping it, uh, they're keeping it cautious. But now it has gone to zero. And as usual, they will have to come up with another fiscal package to expand the economy. Fiscal deficit is expected to be reduced in the coming years, higher revenues, you know, so... They are trying to uh, um, they're trying to mend uh, themselves for uh, after after COVID. All right, now we come to Malaysia. Are you ready to make your prediction now? Are you ready? 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 Sapa ready yang tangan? Ini sudah apa? Knowledge full in the in the. Ilmu penuh di dada ni. Wow, you see so many people already. Right? So what's your prediction? Uh, before you become so today, or the, before you meet, or before we check your predictions, let's see. The growth driven so far is by the service sector. So we have a lot of consumer demand. Uh, that is still there. Yeah, But this consumer demand also, kalau things happen like the targeted subsidies or the income tax, if people, and also if people punya anticipation go overdrive, yeah, extra sangat pessimism, yeah. That's so why we shouldn't have pessimism because it it distorts uh, what's happening in the real economy. So, but um, if we keep this momentum, we should have a good positive year. All right, we should have a good positive year. Uh, we still have a lot of things to clean. I mean, a lot of mess to clean, to clean up. Yes, lah. Yeah, the the economy is not perfect. We want to look at our employment quality, our wage uh, uh, growth, and so on. But um, we are on the right track in the sense that inflation is stabilizing, unemployment has dropped. Yeah, growth is driven by the service sector, tourism, yeah? cars, yeah? Um, and so on. 
industrial production index. This one, Dawson was very happy. It has gone up. Uh, it shows that production activity price, uh, production prices, production goods prices have um, have shown some, you know, some some semangat lah, some life lah dah nak you know hidup balik. Um, exports weakened to some extent because of the slowdown in our trading partners, not because of our our partner bukan masalah dalaman ya, it's because their demand is slowing down, so they don't buy from us. Um, the technology cycle is down, but hopefully it will pick up. US currently tengah pick up. Uh, inflation, we say disinflation, that means inflation getting smaller and smaller, which is good. Uh, it is 1.8% now. But inflation risk still ada di, di, di hujung jalan. Yeah? Um, di, di sepanjang jalan tu, the inflation risk is still there, it's still looming there. Yeah, when the when the economy adjusts in fuel prices and utility tariffs, as well as revision of sales and service tax, and then the policy anticipation that happens uh, along the way as well. So um, our subsidy targeting is is a is has to happen. Yeah, we cannot bear the we cannot take it. Uh, we cannot take that level anymore. Fifty five billion uh, in twenty twenty two. Our debt level sixty five percent cannot also yeah so something needs to uh something needs to change yeah so this is where we are so I would say if you ask me to conclude here um that is it going to be a positive year it will be a positive year if uh, because nobody have, knows what will happen. <laughs> so we have to put a condition. Lah. So it will be a positive year if inflation keeps on decreasing, but not to the level of recession. And we don't want it to go to, to down. Inflation keep on uh, reducing so that um, interest rate can also be reduced. Yeah, like US. Uh, and also in Malaysia to some extent, so that it can also be reduced. And this will help the economy to grow. Okay, so that's one, inflation. We also want productivity, trade, and growth to happen by itself, because this will be the, for sure, this will help the stock market. Okay, this one very direct will definitely help the stock market. Okay. Um, the third one, if... The effect from future government policies, especially subsidy rationalization and taxation, can be absorbed. Or if it is done in a way that is, you know, partial ataupun adalah cara-cara untuk mengurangkan the negative effect or the unintended consequences tu, yeah, then we are looking at a, at a good year. And the fourth is if no more geopolitical shocks or if the geopolitical shots can be resolved, we also will be looking at a normal year, a good year. That means coming out of COVID, we have not really seen a really, kata orang, a really happy year. Kan, walaupun keluar dari COVID, we're still struggling. We're still finding our way out. We've got all these problems and all that. So um, one day we will come out from there, we will come out from the tunnel, this long tunnel of it. But things are looking good. Yeah, things are looking good. And especially if these five things happen, that will be fantastic. But even if two or three of these things happen, we still would have a positive year as a whole for the economy. All right? Okay. You are rasa tak okay. You are not negative answer juga. Okay. Shin. Can I do the questions now? Give me one minute. Yeah, yeah, sure. We have uh, we almost overrun the session, so we'll just uh, do just a few clear. questions on Q and A, right? Uh, so um. Uh, let me address this question to you. Mm. Uh, which one you want? Let me see. Those uh, if you have any questions to ask our speaker today, please write them at the Q and A box. Okay, don't write them at the chat box. Now, I think one of the first. Uh, questions that appear on my screen that people are concerned of is the weakening of Malaysian ringgit. So the question here is, what should the government do to counter that in a short and long-term basis? Do you have any view? 
Okay. Now, the, um, the textbook answer is like this. You increase your interest rate so that you reverse that capital flight problem, yeah, the interest rate differential. Yeah, so people don't, uh, don't, there are many reasons why people um, control their currency yeah, or control their interest rate. But these two are so closely linked together. One way to protect your currency is to increase your interest rate. Right? But the question is, can we afford to increase our interest rate for the sake of protecting our currency? But that's one solution. The other solution to protect currency will be to um, export more, you know, or create that demand for ringgit. Uh, whatever lah the demand, whether you sell, uh, uh, you you liquidate your assets overseas, ke, whether you uh, redeem loans here, you know, yeah, these are create that demand for ringgit instead of create that demand for US. Uh, then the currency, the, the ringgit will slowly go up by itself. Right? So you can give this incentive yang behind the scene incentive so that the companies will create that demand for ringgit. Okay. The third way is government sendiri go into the market and buy, 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 buy ringgit. Which some countries did, even Malaysia did. But it's not something we can afford to do all the time. Especially when we don't know how far or how long this interest rate will happen. So there are three things there again. Interest rate increase, create demand through, uh, through policy incentives or uh, policy changes, or you directly go into the market and defend your ringgit with all the money that you have. You just buy the market, you just buy the ringgit, blind blind so that you can you know you defend it from falling uh, beyond a certain threshold and acceptable uh, 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 value so all this are Ben Nagara's purview to to decide which to do but it is not an easy decision and it is not always the best thing to do yeah uh, so we pray and hope that the solution come from other things and if you recall I said just now that our problem with MYR is mostly because of the real, relative depreciation. Yeah, it's a relative depreciation issue because it's linked to US bergerak one inch up, we will bergerak one inch down. We cannot change that relationship because we are talking about US ringgit punya price. Okay, so if whatever is happening in them, let's say Trump, get elected and then he wants to build another wall because he wants to what do what happened night balik us economy get stimulus package trump did something people will uh, interest rate go up people will go and buy their kita ni sama je but we still will suffer because of that relative relationship tadi so it's very hard to uh, control yeah uh, and that's why it's sometimes pointless to to kejar, kejar, kejar and sacrifice our interest rate and the rest of us for that uh, matter, uh, for, the, for that pursuit. Okay? All right. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, I hope you next... understand that one. Uh -huh. Yeah, sure. I think you have given us uh, enough pointers to think about why uh -huh. the break it depreciate. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, the next question is by Sue. What is the difference between GDP growth rate and GDP and no growth rate. You know, sometimes when we read out the data, you know, uh, uh, in particular US, we will see that you know, uh, G the GDP growth rate is like three point two percent. But if you look at annual growth rate, it could be a different figure, maybe two point nine percent. Um, yes. Yeah, so that's why um the comparison between countries you you use normally you use a GDP growth rate, yeah. Uh, so it depends what you want to uh what you want to see you want to see the um analyzed growth rate without the base coming into the picture without you know without, without being influenced by the base or where you are starting from uh, then you look at analyzed or, or or normalized growth rate but if you want to see just what is the absolute change that will be the uh, gdp growth rate okay um Okay. How come in 
how come interest increase and remain but deposit reduce? Yeah. How come <laughs> interest increase? How come interest increase but deposit reduce? Deposit uh, interest rate reduce. Uh, deposit is not controlled by policy. Deposit is controlled by the banks. Yeah. So the banks may have their own decision if the cost of funds is high, they may not be able or they cannot if or if they cannot invest the, the, the money that you put there well, then they are not able to give you a good uh, deposit interest. Yeah, so I think the answer to that is that one is bad because um, there is no policy, direct policy on the deposit rate that the, the banks offer to uh, their depositors. Mm, all right, thank you so much, doctor. Uh, the next question is by Chick. Do you think it's logical that Malaysia inflation rate will go below 2%? Uh, mana, mana. Logical, logic, logic. Now it's already 1.8 kan? ke 2.4. Uh, it's, it's logical if there are, uh, I mean, numbers are logic, lah. Like, whichever numbers they come, it's the numbers. Yeah, they are not, they are not numbers that Dawson just pick out of the blue. But why it could go to uh, two percent that low is if there is no changes in the um uh, in the prices of that broad base basket. Okay, now. Laymen will look at prices on the street and what they consume. But the, the basket is about hundreds and hundreds of goods. Okay. Um, and they get this data on a daily basis and they have their formula to calculate. So of course there will be some offset and you know something like that. And what they are looking for is they will re, they will move, they will chuchi all this sometimes. Yang fluctuation yang kita panggil macam white noise to see the real trend, right? To see the real trend. Sometimes that's why it's kejap kejap aja. Not so inflation is not naik banyak, but uh, what we say? It's not something that we want to measure. The naik selalu, tapi the naik banyak mana? So you want to see the trend actually, yeah. Um, so that's why we find. A discrepancy between what we observe on the ground and what the inflation numbers tell us. Um, but bank negara or central banks, they will look at this broad-based core inflation uh, and they will pin up to see what is the price trend at the end of it, what is the actual price trend at, at the base of it, uh, not the small, small, small ones. Okay. All right. Uh, or not yeah. the or not the not the isolated cases, uh, what we say, idiosyncrasies in the market. Some are very vulnerable, some are very stable. Uh, you know that, yeah. Because right. you cannot make a, a, a policy decision on something that is not clearly proven, memang consistent, memang persistent. Yeah, otherwise, we go crazy. Can So that's what they're looking at. Lah. Any more questions that I must really, really answer before I go, if I can't answer all? Yeah, I think uh, that's the, all the time we have for the Q&A session today. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, I think the questions are overwhelming. We are not able to address all questions at the moment. <laughs> so uh, uh, don't worry, if uh, chances arise, we will invite Dr. Haniza back to address any economic-related questions that you may have. Um, so um, thank you so much, Doctor, for uh, doing this session for us. And uh, I think now uh, I believe that many of us here today, we have gain a better understanding about how do we analyze macroeconomic factor uh, that may affect the stock market, okay? And we, we also learned that, you know, stock market always run ahead of the economy. So this is something that we will uh, bear in mind, all right? So um, ladies and gentlemen, you just heard from Dr. Haniza Khalid, who is an economist. Thank you so much, uh, Dr.